Welcome to our Music in Europe Showcase of Learning. We are pleased to present our findings after three weeks of fairly rigorous travel and experiential learning opportunities. We traveled to four cities in 21 days, experiencing some of the highest points in Western musical heritage, as well as having fun navigating foreign languages, metro systems, concert cultures, and hostel breakfasts. We made new friends in Vienna, Prague, and Paris, visited old friends, expected to be surprised, challenged, and educated about cultural and musical traditions, and we were not disappointed. We now begin with Vienna, where we all landed on Wednesday, December 28th, to begin the adventure. was established on the banks of the Danube River in Central Europe in 500 BC. Fortified by Roman military, it survived two sieges from the Turks about 1600 years later, only to be defeated by Napoleon in 1809. Beethoven was dismayed and changed the dedication of his Eroica symphony from Napoleon to the Czech Prince Lobkowitz. More on him later. Meanwhile, the Habsburg family had maintained rule in Vienna for hundreds of years, continuing to patronize the arts and especially music. They supported Viennese composers, including Beethoven, Mozart, Strauss, and Vivaldi. Even today, many contemporary composers make Vienna their home. To better understand the significance of the deep and constant patronage of the Habsburgs, we visited Schönbrunn Palace and Gardens with an interactive tour. Current Viennese culture is seen in the Christmas market that takes place in the courtyard in front of the Schönbrunn Palace and in the beautiful gardens on the backside of the palace. As we walked through the extensive palace, including both private and public rooms, we saw elaborately designed drawing rooms, salons, libraries, bedrooms, royal offices, and throne rooms that showed how central the palace was to Habsburg governance, and how the Habsburgs presented the palace as a center of innovation and cultural significance. One room had expensive redwood walls and mirrors facing each other to create the illusion of endless space, almost signifying how the empire envisioned the reach of its influence at that time. The palace was also a performance venue for famed composers and musicians. Mozart performed for the first time for royalty at age six, and yes, for the Habsburgs. At the end of his performance, ran over to Empress Maria Theresa to climb on her lap for a hug. Again, the Habsburgs were known for their patronage, and composers could, because of the Habsburg family, create the types of large-scale orchestral and operatic works that would have otherwise been impossible. We visited two historic and currently running state-funded music venues in Vienna, the Musikverein and the Staatsoper. The Gesellschaft der Musikfreunde was founded by a group of friends and the Musikverein holds around 800 concerts per season. It is world-renowned for its acoustics, even though it was built at a time when acoustical properties were not yet known. The main hall, which is built mainly from wood, is constructed with an acoustic property that amplifies sound waves and is often, itself, used in instrument building. The hall materials, combined with the specific symmetries of the hall, allow all the listeners in the room to experience the same high-level sound quality. We attended the New Year's Eve concert, Sylvester concert, after our tour and heard the acoustics for ourselves, and yes, confirmed them as outstanding. We enjoyed a soprano singing opera, 
clapping along to the Radetzky march and marveled at the delicacy of an authentic zither performance. Baden is a small town about 40 kilometers south of Vienna. The word Baden means baths, which signifies the importance of the mineral hot springs there that people would visit in hope of improving their health. Despite a location so far from the city center, this little town has a close relationship with both Beethoven and Mozart. In 1791, Mozart and his wife, Constanza, came to Baden so his wife could visit the baths. While there, Mozart composed a short motet, a choral work, for the local parish church, whose music director was his friend. Our broad group was granted access to the organ loft at this parish church, St. Stephen's, through a local connection to the current organist, Herr Wiesmann. This was a very rare opportunity, and we were allowed to perform Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus up in the choir loft. Dr. Whitmore accompanied our class on this historic organ, which was built in 1744, and was also possibly played by Mozart himself. It was a special experience to rehearse and prepare this piece during the pre-trip music course, but to actually sing it in the church where it was premiered was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It was thrilling. We felt connected to Mozart, European music tradition, and understood something about the value of well-composed music for humanity. Here we were performing in the original church where this piece premiered over 230 years earlier. The acoustics were breathtaking in this large cathedral, combining pipe organ and our singing of broad group. Experiencing Mozart in this setting gave us all a new appreciation of the style of choral music and why it is an important inheritance in the modern age. On the same day, 
we also met a dear friend of Principia named Ilsa Mozer. Ilsa has maintained a long-standing relationship with Principia College for many decades and has supported many different abroad programs. Ilsa was so sweet with our group and was the most knowledgeable tour guide. In Baden, we attended the Beethoven House, a quaint summer residence where Ludwig von Beethoven composed his iconic Ninth Symphony. In this home, we learned about Beethoven's love of the spa town and his desire to for the unification of humanity. Away from the political complexities he faced in Vienna, Beethoven really enjoyed nature and taking lots of walks on trails outside of this small town, even walking 30 kilometers in one day. Beethoven loved the surrounding woods, and it may be related that one of the food franchises in Vienna is called Wienerwald, which means Viennese woods. After having visited the birthplace of the symphony, we heard the Ninth Symphony the next day. It was helpful and instructive to think how such a magnificent and universally loved symphony could have been composed in such humble surroundings. Sitting in a beautiful music house, the abroad group amazed with the elegance that filled their eyes. Soon, singers start to line the back row, showing the full and beautiful choir, with four opera singers in front ensuring that they are visible. The conductor raises his hand, and sweet music fills our ears. The music creates a sense of brotherhood and of humanity itself. Other adventures into Austrian and Viennese culture included a waltz class in New Year's festivities called Sylvester in German-speaking countries. Here are a couple of journal entries. Waltz class. People walked into the room apprehensively as the instructor, Stefan, stood in the middle waiting for us to step away from the wall. The moment never arrives. Stefan explains the cultural history, talking about the fluidity of the motion and how people should move together to ensure that they don't step on other people's feet. We practice individually first as the instructor shows us his greatest patience because we all trip over our feet. On New Year's Eve, flowing into New Year's Day naturally, Stefan's Platz was bustling as everyone was excited because it was the first year the Sylvesterabend concerts were held since COVID shut down the city. This event, although not necessarily held by a certain organization, had radio stations blasting their music and live concerts could be heard from down the street. Moving bodies and excited chatter filled the street standing room only. As groups made their way back to the hostel, nothing but adrenaline filled the veins in hope that we made it back to the hostel in time. Watching the fireworks from the top of the hostel ringing in the new year, people cheered and watched in awe as the fireworks seemed endless against the dark night sky. We wrapped up Vienna with some individual adventures that we submitted for approval to our professors. This was one day in each city where our professors gave us flexibility to experience the culture of each city using our own personal academic lens. Students explored a variety of different elements of our three cities during these days. Viennese, Czech, and Parisian culture included museums, libraries, boat tours, bus tours, cathedral tours, and even concerts for students. These days allowed students to more deeply explore an area of the local culture that resonated individually and always ended with a group dinner where each student shared with the rest of the group the adventures we had experienced and the new things that we had learned.
On January 4, we gathered at the Haupt Bahnhof to board a train to Prague, making our way through the Carpathian Mountains and Bohemian Uplands to the northeast of the Czech Republic. As we traveled, we noted the station signs changing from German to Czech and the shift in architecture from tidally constructed Austrian homes and shops to the more free-form urban and rural planning of the Czech Republic. We disembarked at the main station in Prague, took vans to our hotel, and found ourselves moving to what became the dense urban landscape at the center of Prague. The city of Prague grew around Prague Castle, which was founded on the hillside overlooking the city in 870 AD. The city that eventually surrounded the castle in hundreds of years following has become a twisting but picturesque assortment of buildings and narrow streets that hold a history as rich as its tumultuous. In modern times, communism became a central player in Prague's socio-political development, but this socio-political and financial model was firmly renounced in the past three decades, and the Czech population has worked hard to leave communism behind. Smiling in public is seen as a mark of a foreigner or a fool, but the city's reserved citizens are notable for their high regard of genuine interaction. The city is enigmatic and full of old traditions and, of course, music. The Christmas season in Prague ends January 6th on Epiphany, the arrival of the wise men at the manger. Prague's Christmas markets were still up when we arrived in the city. The markets brought people together from all parts of the region to celebrate the Christmas season and unite in distinctive Czech traditions. They were placed to experience the unique atmosphere, Czech Christmas carols, as well as indulge in Tretelnik, a sugary pastry famous in the markets. In the evening, some of us explored the Prague Christmas market and made plans to get to know the historical power structures influencing Prague the next day so we could compare them to the ways of Vienna and understand the music better. We had the opportunity to visit Lobkowitz Palace, next door to Prague Castle. The Lobkowitz family were patrons of the arts, sciences, education, and were very close to the ruling Habsburg family over many generations. We visited the ancestral palace in Prague, which was repatriated to the original owners after several occupations by the Nazis and communists, with still ongoing reclamation of multiple estates across the Czech countryside. In a very personable audio guide throughout the museum, delivered by actual members of the Lobkowitz family, we learned about the family's commitment to making these artworks accessible to the public for future generations. It was the seventh Prince Lobkowitz who was the most famous patron of the arts, supporting Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven. In the case of Beethoven, Prince Lobkowitz collaborated with two other Viennese noblemen to sponsor a yearly living stipend for Beethoven to stay in Vienna and continue composing, rather than move to another European city. This spoke to the huge influence of Beethoven on Viennese music at that time in history, and why his music has had such longevity, and the value of patronage in keeping music traditions alive and accessible to the world. had the opportunity for a day trip to travel 100 kilometers outside of Prague to Hradec Králové, a fortified medieval castle of the Bohemian royal family. There we toured the city center with its Renaissance style buildings before visiting a rehearsal of the Czech boy choir. Our point of contact was the choir's accompanist, Dr. Wharton Agopian, a pianist 
conductor, composer, and a lecturer at Charles University. Dr. Agopian was able to invite our Principia Broad group into the rehearsal to observe the singing as they practice for upcoming performances in Lebanon and Oman. The Czech boy choir's name comes from its heritage, originating as one of the main ensembles for the St. Vitus Church in Prague. The name Boni Pueri is Latin for good boys, as they travel and perform worldwide. It was inspiring to see the discipline and enthusiasm of these boys, in total 80 boys ages 4 through 19, and their commitment to the highest level of musical excellence in this group. Some of these young boys began singing in the choir at age of 3 and we admire the commitment of their families to bring their children to bi-weekly rehearsals and support a schedule for up to 10 concerts a month for some of the most experienced boys. It was also impressive how the city has a youth choir that often shares its music on a worldwide stage. The group of boys in this photo was only the altos and sopranos in the choir it was approximately half of the boys' choir. It was a privilege to experience this rehearsal firsthand. While there initially seemed to be a language barrier, we overcame these limitations through our common language of music. When we traveled back to Prague, we continued on our musical journey by visiting a small museum by the beautiful Moldau River, a river immortalized in Smetana's tone poem from his work Mavlast, which means my homeland. The pride that Czech culture puts on its traditions, history, music, mythology, and landscape was mirrored in this museum. Bedrik Smetna was a Czech composer known for his monumental six-part work, a series of six-tone poems about Czech folk culture, history, and religion. Each movement speaks to an integral element of the Czech identity and is considered today to epitomize Czech folk culture. Smetna wrote, Music is the language of feeling, words are the language of ideas. The six poems represented different ideas and intuitions or feelings that were the most important to the Czech culture the main theme representing the river as it runs through the city and is constantly flowing. Smetana lost his hearing after writing the first poem, much like Beethoven. Smetana saw the value of encapsulating the emotional experience of the world around him in musical expression as a way to give the Czech people a sense of identity. On our last day, we had a Czech folk culture celebration with our new Prague friend, Dr. Vartan Agopian, and his wife. That night was very interactive. We sang folk music with a traditional Czech folk group, and we danced to live folk music. Dr. Vartan's wife, Lucy Agopianova, played the violin and taught us about the history of Czech folk music from early to modern. We learned that in Czech culture, married women change the ending of their new last names and add an ova as a suffix. With her, we learned a traditional Czech folk song called Vejer Vejer, which was about a peasant woman bringing a farmer a poppy seed cake. We also learned to dance the polka with our wonderful host and teacher who taught us the timing and dynamics of polka dance, as well as the history of the dance and music. Throughout the evening, our wonderful hosts provided us with a buffet of amazing traditional Czech food. One of the highlights of our meal was kofola, which is a spicy Czech cola. It was special to experience these traditional folk dances and songs with our new friends and to appreciate how the group's centered dances were used to knit together Czech society at this time.
On a bright Thursday morning, our broad group flew to Paris, where we arrived in one of the largest cities in Europe. At present, the population of Paris is around 11 million. Over 32 million people a year visit Paris because of its rich history, beautiful architecture, romantic reputation, fashion, and world-renowned cuisine. In Paris, we were greeted with cold wind and busy streets, everything you would expect from a popular city in the winter, as we walked excitedly to the Arc du Triomphe. The Arc stood tall and bright in contrast with the dark night sky. We learned about the burning torch at the Arc du Triomphe as a symbol of remembrance for the unknown soldier who sacrificed his life during World War I. And we stood in line and mustered the energy to climb the long spiral staircase. However, the view that met us at the top was well worth the labor needed to climb once we viewed the Eiffel Tower across the city in awe. The Eiffel Tower was designed for the World's Fair in 1889 and is obviously a significant Parisian monument. La Tour Eiffel, as the French call it, has exemplified Paris's uniqueness and modernity for more than a century. We had the opportunity to explore several important royal family complexes, learning about French kings from the 9th century to the 18th. First, we went to the Royal Chapel, Saint-Chapelle, next door to Notre Dame, still being reconstructed from its 2019 fire. In Saint-Chapelle, we ascended the spiral stairs and walked into a beautifully lit chapel that was constructed for the nobles and the upper class. It was grand with a high vaulted ceiling and stained glass windows on every wall with one big rose window above the balcony behind us. There are nearly 2,000 square feet of stained glass around Saint-Chapelle, more windows than walls. The elaborate stained glass windows contained each story from the Bible, followed sequentially by stories of the lineage of French kings who viewed themselves as present-day intermediaries between their people and God and as continuing the holy work of the Bible. We can imagine that a strong sense of cultural, spiritual, moral identity would develop around this model of thinking. And we certainly came away from this cathedral understanding better the collective influence and strength of French culture. Later in the week, we visited Versailles. The architectural style reminded us of Schönbrunn in Vienna, but on an even greater scale since Versailles was the model for Schönbrunn. The weather on the day we visited perfectly accented the magnificent golden gates with dramatic clouds scattered across a vivid blue sky. One of the highlights of our Versailles tour was seeing a music room that belonged to one of the daughters of Louis XIV, where the walls were decorated with images of musical instruments. One of the most iconic and beautiful spaces in Versailles was the Hall of Mirrors. Louis XIV used this kind of extravagance to control his sometimes volatile political situation at court. It was fun to imagine dancing at a ball in the Grand Hall. Later that evening, the group returned to Versailles to watch the performance of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro in the private opera house that had been built for the king. Walking up to Versailles with the stars shining and near brightly lit buildings was like walking up to a grand royal event lacking only carriages. The opera was quite a spectacular presentation. The Marriage of Figaro characters of Figaro, Susanna, the Count and Countess, and all the minor characters made us laugh and cry with Mozart's characteristically witty social commentary about love triumphing over the oppression of class and gender. One highlight was the Countess's aria Dove Sono in the third scene where she received several standing ovations before the opera could continue.
Another wonderful opportunity for our group to connect with European art and culture was with an organization called La Maison de Calligraphy. We learned the script called La Caroline, which originated in France around the 8th and 9th century and was later refined in the Renaissance period to become the precursor to standard typeface and scripts. This art form and business practice, since it was both in many instances, took a long time requiring precision and people also wanted it to be pleasing to look at. The French value style and sophistication and take pride in the beauty and artistry of their country and it became evident that calligraphy was first an art. The content of the communication was magnified by the vehicle of elegant handwriting. You like jazz? Then Europe is the place for you. There are lots of jazz clubs all throughout the different cities, each with a different specialty and vibe. In Prague, we found a jazz club that had only drums, a bass, and a piano, which is a little unusual for a jazz band as it was missing all brass instruments. In Paris, the jazz club doubled as a swing dance club, with spectators joining in to dance to the groove of the live jazz band. We had the opportunity to see 42nd Street, an American musical, at the Théâtre du Chalet. The musical was presented for a French audience with French brochures and French subtitles on the side of the stage. And it was curious to see how packed the theater was on a Saturday afternoon to see an American musical because it gave us a glimpse of how the American musical remains popular in international culture. On the final stretch of our trip, we had Let Paris Be Your Teacher Day. Students chose a variety of adventures on a Monday in Paris, which ranged from the contemporary Pompidou Museum, riverboat tours, revisiting previous sites to learn more, or exploring the famous Champs-Élysées. One of the most surprising but ultimately successful submissions for the day was Disneyland Paris. What were our professors thinking by letting us go to Disneyland Paris during an academic trip? They said we had to make a compelling argument for this activity. We won them over when we were able to show that Disney had needed to adapt American-style presentation to be compatible with French traditions. The musical presentations and venues were an excellent opportunity for the kind of cultural competence analysis that we were asked to do all the time on this trip. Here's what we learned about how Disney evolved its business plan to become culturally appropriate and even successful for Paris. One of the ways Disney failed when initially building this park was that they mistakenly aimed to please European culture as a unified whole, which doesn't really exist since there are hundreds of different cultures in Europe. French culture is known for being protective of its own traditions and skeptical of international infiltration, up to and including being skeptical of words without a French origin. The American Disney Company needed to really understand French culture in order to salvage its business model, to understand the liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, fraternity, that is seen over the doorway of all French government offices. We have three examples to share of this shift to more culturally competent practice. Because many elements that Americans find exotic and magical, like castles and national costumes, are very common cultural touchstones in Europe, this meant that Disney had to find another way to create what would feel like the magic of a fairy tale experience. In the musical shows, Disney decided to include small participatory dance activities. The idea of linking communal dance to these experiences removed some modern social divisions, which paid homage to the fraternité portion of the French motto. Another of the challenges that Disney faced was helping the French cast members to feel comfortable with smiling at strangers, part of the tried and true American recipe for creating happiness, but not one that worked in France. 
By the time of the reboot, Euro Disney successfully trained their cast members to meet the Disney standard by hiring locally rather than from the U.S. and allowing more variations in dress code than in the U.S., relating to the essence of personal liberté. One final interesting feature we found reflective of a Disney's understanding of this multilingual region is that the live musical shows that we watched at Disneyland Paris had dialogue split between French and English, so that listeners who spoke one language would still be able to mostly understand the song. This demonstrated a common etiquette and cultural sensitivity that spoke to the égalité of the French motto and formed the basis for Disney's successful reboot and warm reception for the park. In conclusion, on our last day in the morning, we reflected in journals on our trip, visited the Eiffel Tower, and had dessert overlooking a night view of Notre Dame which is being rebuilt after the surprise fire in 2019. This last experience combines the rebirth of the 12th century cathedral with desserts in a warm, cozy restaurant, sharing postcards from our professors about the leadership and support we all shared with each other on the trip after navigating countless metro stops and complex linguistic encounters. This last night illustrates the broad range of experience that we were now comfortable with, thanks to Vienna, Prague, and Paris's rich cultural opportunities for learning and growth. We topped off the evening by hearing American swing and boogie woogie music in an amazing underground jazz venue. Caveau de la Huchette featured amazing French jazz musicians and a vibrant swing dance crowd. It was a fun way to see how all our experiences tied together from around the world. The cross-pollination of American jazz with French culture was just one more important way that our lives and cultures are interconnected. Thank you to our parents, guardians, relatives, network of support, professors, and to the Broad Office for making this Principia Abroad a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The experiences from the abroad program have enriched our lives and broadened our cultural horizons. We take from this abroad a deepened appreciation for the structures of beauty, order and soul, as well as the seeds of inspiration for our own continuing relationships with the arts and international cultures. The arts and music transcend languages, cultures and borders, and help exchange ideas and styles and share in the artistic vibrancy born from diverse experiences and traditions. Music brings us together, helping us reflect upon who we are, where we have come from, and what lies ahead. We look forward to what lies ahead for each of us after this experience. Mm -hmm.